Good morning. Another beautiful weekend here in, in Dallas, and, and whether you're online or participating in person, we're so glad you're here to, to, together for worship, um, and to worship our risen Lord as we continue the season of Easter, and we're going to start a new sermon series on uh, 1 Peter, the first letter written by uh, the apostle and disciple Peter, and um, this, this whole idea of what does it mean to have a living hope? And no, this is not a series on Star Wars. That's a new hope. It's a very similar, but different hopes. You guys are in a good mood today. Good, good. I, I, I can try some jokes in my sermon, so good, good to know. <laughs> you never know with this group. No, it's joke. It is great to have you all here. Uh, we have Dr. Norm uh, playing organ for us and, and leading us musically while Gabrielle takes a Sunday off. And uh, much needed break after the, the busyness of Easter. So. We are so glad you are here uh, to worship. We do begin uh, with our opening hymn, number 466, Christ has arisen, hallelujah. And we ask you to stand at the fifth verse, the last verse.
That was anticlimactic. <laughs> we gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment to reflect on that. Let us then together confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, renew us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Friends, I have good news. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to, to become the children of God and bestows upon them the gift of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our psalm is number 148, read responsively. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him from the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he has commanded and they were created. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all deeps. Mountains and hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth. Young men together, old men children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above the earth and the heaven. Continue with the Kyrie, just a reminder that the responses are sung. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and from our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth.
Lord be with you. We pray together. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Having been reconciled to God, we share and show our reconciliation to each other by the sharing of the peace. And you may be seated for the readings. The first reading is from the book of Acts, starting at chapter 5, verse 29. But Peter the Apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, Take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He, too, perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple from house and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel reading is from the book of John's chapter 20, starting at the 19th verse. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace 
be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when they, he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness of any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, the disciples were inside again, and Thomas was among them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, You have believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
Hello again. Good morning. Grace, mercy, and peace be from God as we meditate on this word. May this meditation be pleasing in his sight. Amen. Amen. A living hope. I said, like I said, over the next several weeks, kind of going through even Pentecost and, and Ascension, we're going to be looking, going a, a, a few verses at a time through the letter of 1 Peter. And, and, and it's a significant letter because uh, Peter himself, the, the apostle of, of Jesus, the one of the closest of, of the three, like last week we looked at John, the writer of Revelation, only gave us two letters. We only have two writings from him, which you know, like compared to Paul and, and, and Luke, who wrote two big books. I mean, we, the amount of information we get directly from Peter is relatively small compared to the rest of some of the other writers. And yet he was such an influence in the early church. He was such an influence in the, in the, amongst the disciples and, and uh, certainly comes out as a, as a major player, a major character in both Acts and uh, the Gospels. When was the last time you received one of these? What is that? What is that? Well, I'll go back to it here. Well, what is that right there? A letter, right? I mean, some of our kids don't even know what those are. Like a handwritten letter. That, that's an actual handwritten letter. Um, you can find them still in stores. And, or, or, or order them on Amazon. So there you go. But when was the last time you received... I'm not talking about a card with a little note. I'm talking an actual handwritten letter. Like someone updating their life to you through a handwritten letter. Has it been years? Decades? A month. A month. All right, there you go. Um, some people used to send annual Christmas letters, and, and those are all digital now, even. Um, yeah, when was the last time you wrote a handwritten letter? I'm pretty sure if I tried to write one, they wouldn't be able to read it anyway. But m now we type it, or, or, more, or more really, like, what do we do? We, we don't even type them anymore. You see, an actual handwritten letter from another person, letter writing is pretty much a lost art, right? For the most part, this is a of writing a handwritten letter to another person. That's pretty much a lost word. Instead, we now send messages more like this. Anyone want to try to translate that? It is great to see you tonight. Thank you for your treats. Anyone gotten something more like that recently? Where they're trying to, yeah, yeah, no emojis. Yeah, this is a little dated, right? Like, there's, there's no emojis on it, but right. But you get something like that the first time, and you're like, what is this? And we laugh, but people that, in academia, especially in, in the college level, are noting that we're raising up a generation of kids that don't know how to even spell or how to write proper sentence structure because... This is what they. This is how they've learned to write, and it's and it's a challenge. And they're having to go to sometimes kids that, that do well in high school even are, are having to learn these things when they get to college. The things that we all learned in middle school or before. But yeah, that's that's you're more likely to get that than you are an actual handwritten letter anymore. True, true. And we all we all bemoan that to some extent, but we also laugh because we know it's <coughs> true. It's great to see you tonight. Thank you for your treats. That's what that letter actually said. Yet a personal letter, a note, or even a greeting is still a very meaningful thing to receive. Now, we may not get letters anymore, but we still get sometimes a handwritten card for a birthday or a great occasion. We still get emails, and we do get texts when people actually spell their words. Um, but we... To receive a personal note, a message, a letter, whether electronically, whether digitally, whatever, is always a treat. It's, it, and it's something that, that, that uplifts us. 
So imagine, for example, being an early Christian church in the first century, you know, 20, 30 years after Jesus had, had died, and, and you're an early church, and you're not gathering in a big space like this, probably gathering in someone's home. You're gathering um, under the realization that you're not even, it's not even really legal for you to exist. You know, you, you don't have any status in the government whatsoever, kind of like being a a Christian church in China right now or in the Middle East, a place like that. So you can't, no, no bulletins for, for, you know, for events at the Elks Lodge. No, none of that. I mean, it, you're underground. You're, and, you, and you, all of a sudden, you receive a letter from Peter, one of the apostles. You receive a handwritten note. Or like a, a letter from James, a letter from Paul. And that's what we see in the last part of our, of our Bible, these, these letters. And they, some were written to people, some were written to churches, individuals. Some were more of a circular letter, which is kind of this was where it was sent to several people. And, 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 and likely several copies were made, either by the original writer himself or by others. And, and by copies, we mean handwritten copies, um, not... You know, digital copies, not anything like that. So imagine that. Imagine you're this little church, you're, you're struggling, you're, you're, you're dealing with, with the challenges of just normal life, plus being, knowing that, that if you're found out about for being a church, it could, it could lead to problems for you and your family. You're struggling, you're feeling discouraged. You're wondering if we should even stick with this thing called this early movement called the way, which was what it was originally called, or Christianity. And yet you receive this letter, this letter to kind of <clears throat> from Peter himself that's going to uplift you and, and give you encouragement in what you are doing. That is what we're dealing with for the next several weeks is this letter. This, and, and it's not a long letter, but it takes up about you know, four pages of a Bible, three and a half pages, and, but really powerful teachings, really powerful words, really powerful encouragement for not only the churches that received this letter, but for us today. Our readings is from 1 Peter beginning at the first, the first chapter beginning at the first verse. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect, Exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling of his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. That's where that phrase comes from, a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in this last time. In this you rejoice, though for now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with him a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you 
and things that are now been announced to you through those who have preached the, the good news to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven things into which the angels to look. Thus ends the reading. Peter begins this letter with a greeting and blessing to encourage people that are facing various trials. And he, and he says this, so it's a very basic beginning, it's a structure you would expect in a letter. And once again, this letter is not to a certain person, and it's not even to a certain church. It's, like I said, it's pro it probably meant to be sent to several different churches, and several different gatherings of, of, of believers. And he says, you know, he, he, he starts with affirming who he is, uh, Peter, I'm an apostle of Christ, so they would have all known who he was. To those that are elect, exiles of the dispersion. And the dispersion just means that people that are spread out. Most likely, mostly a Jewish audience at this point, but not, probably not exclusively. <clears throat> but dispersion means just people that had been dispersed, had been spread out um, to different parts of the world. And he lists some of these places. And, and he says this, according to the foreknowledge of God. So he, he's kind of putting this idea that you are dispersed for a reason. You're in the, in the community you're in for a reason. Um, God knew where you were going to be. Um, and he says, that you, are, you are elect. You, you, are, you are elected for salvation. You are chosen by God and, and, and for, through, the, through his foreknowledge. And, the, and then being sanctified by the Spirit. So you have this Trinity focus. We have the, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit all kind of contained in this greeting and then talks about with Jesus and he makes this interesting little side note about Jesus he says sprinkling with his blood you've been sprinkled with his blood likely uh, likely a reference to communion an early reference to communion but also this idea that your election was secure in the sprinkling of his blood so here he's he's greeting them and he's offering them a blessing but why is he offering them this blessing? Well, it's to encourage them. So further down the letter, he says, you rejoice, though for a while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So these, he's encouraging them for a very specific reason. A living hope, that they would have a living hope in their trials. Now, he doesn't specify what, at least here, what those trials are. We, 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 we believe that likely some of it was persecution for being believers, but we don't know what all the, the trials were. But that's not so different from us. When we, when we, sometimes when you see, receive a prayer list or a prayer request for someone, you don't know what it is that they are seeking prayer for. You just have a name. You just have a, a situation, right? And you may know a little bit of the information. And yet, you know that your job in that moment is to offer encouragement to that person in their situation, whatever their situation may be. So he said, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, but he gives a specific reason for these trials. For the testing of their faith. And we'll get back to that here in a second, but keep that in mind. That, 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 that there's a reason for these trials. He wants them to understand that these trials that are happening to them are not just this thing in isolation or this thing that's, that's not can't be dealt with or can't be overcome, but there's a specific reason for them. He wants to encourage this group of people. So in this, he reminds them to be joyful, to rejoice, even though they are going through these trials, what do they rejoice in? The living hope that comes from the resurrection of Jesus. So he goes on to say this, he says, blessed be the God, the Father of Jesus, according to his grace and mercy, has caused us, so he's not saying caused you, he's saying what, caused us, we're in this together, to be born again to a living hope 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This whole season that we call Easter, right, that starts with Easter Sunday and goes on for several weeks, the focus of this whole season is what? The, the resurrection, right? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. That there is an empty tomb. And then the readings, you know, Thomas versus you know, Doubting and all of that are all about this affirmation of the resurrection. So he's saying you have a living hope. And that living hope came to you through what? What event in history gives us a living hope? A hope that continues no matter what, that allows us to rejoice in all circumstances. The living hope is that the resurrection actually happened. That the singular event of Jesus' resurrection, which is the promise also of our own resurrection, actually happened. Happen. And that is the ultimate source of those who follow Jesus. That is the ultimate source of our hope, is that there is a risen Christ. And that because of that, we can have a living hope. And he also, like I said before, he wants them to know that these trials are there for a reason. What is that reason? To test the genuineness of their faith, which is more precious than Gold. Now, back in Jesus' time, to actually have physical gold was a sign of wealth, right? To, to have, and it is still to some extent today, but for the most part, a sign of a wealth. Like if you were saying this today, which is, which is even more precious than your 401k <laughs> or, or, or whatever, he would say, you know, but it, what is more precious than, than your material, whatever that, however you explain that today. So and he, what he's saying here is that, that trials are there for a reason so that to test the genuineness of your faith. And he says this, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor in the revelation of Jesus Christ. So gold, even that, even gold will eventually perish. Gold, gold, can perish. It, it, it's not going to last forever. But what is going to last forever is a living hope, right? A living hope in Jesus. So he's saying that the, the trials that you're facing, whatever they are to this group, they are there to test your faith. Think about that. All of us have, who, have, who have lived a while in faith, has your faith ever been tested? Has your belief in Jesus ever been tested? Has your trust, has your living hope ever been tested? Sure, we all have faced trials. We've all faced difficulties. We've all faced challenges in this thing called faith. And this thing called following Jesus. And this journey that we take together. We all have faced these trials and if you're honest with yourself would you say that coming out of those trials your faith was stronger your hope was stronger your living hope was blooming like like the flowers that we see around us right now that's something i love about this time of year and expressed in the uh, the banner right we're in that little green top corner where things are starting to, to bloom and, and you see, other than the allergies, the only negative of that, you, you see new growth. You see birds chirping. You see this new sense of life that is coming. And that's what he's talking about here, this, this living hope that the, the trials, if you will, could be seen as winter, right? Can you survive the winter? Although in Texas, that's kind of weak. But those of you from the Midwest know what it means to, like, actually survive a winter. And you come out of winter with what? New hope. A living hope. See flowers, you see birds, you see you get more sunlight, and everybody's mood's a little bit better because you've tested that season of winter, that season of challenges, that season of trials. And Peter wants this group of believers that are facing very difficult trials, maybe even 
maybe even and even likely the risk of death for what they believe. And he's saying in this, this is here for a reason, to test the genuineness of your faith, which is what? Even more precious than gold or your 401k. And then he says to them that this results in praise and glory and honor. And he goes, even though you've not seen him, once again, this is this idea of the resurrection, and this also kind of ties it back to Thomas, right? Doubting Thomas, who I'll only believe what if I see for myself. And then Jesus says to them, bless those who never see but believe. And Peter would have been there in that event, so he would have known what exactly happened there. He's saying that to them. Blessed are you. You didn't get to see Jesus while he was on earth, but yet you still believe. You've not seen him and you love him. You believe in him and you rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible filled with glory. Have you ever had inexpressible joy? Been so happy, so full of joy that words can't even express that level of joy. We get that a few times in our lives. You know, birth of a child, maybe at a wedding, you know, maybe at a at a big event in your in your life, your team wins the Super Bowl, whatever. But we have these moments in our lives where we where we're so happy, we're so joyful, we're so excited that we can't even come up with the words to express that level of joy. And he says, all of this has been revealed to them by the Holy Spirit, the good news of salvation, and this came from who? The prophets before. So he's reminding them that all of this that came together in Jesus is what had been promised for centuries before by the prophets. And he says this, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The fact that to know that Jesus died on the cross for your salvation, for, so that you can have faith, is a source of an inexpressible joy. And it says, concerning this, the prophets searched carefully inquiring about, about being led by the Spirit of Christ and to when all this would happen. So that gives this group of believers in, in these cities, even though they didn't see Jesus for themselves, they were the first generation of people to hear about that. And they're hearing about it from Peter. They're hearing about it from James, they're hearing it from John and Paul, people that actually encountered Jesus, that touched him, that saw him, that interacted with him. And despite that, they were, they were discouraged because, why? Because they were facing trials. And they needed this letter, they needed these, these words to remind them of the good news of salvation which was shared by the prophets before. But guess what, friends? We've been talking about this all, day, all morning, but this good news has been revealed to us in our trials as well. I asked you to consider earlier, when's the time that your faith was put to the test? When was the time in your life that you faced difficult trials? Maybe so difficult that you didn't know if you were going to come through them. Maybe a trial in a relationship. Maybe a trial financially. Maybe a trial health-wise. When you, when you were on your knees praying to God, am I going to come through this? Am I going to make it? Or is my friend going to make it? Or is this other person going to make it? And you come through that trial, you come through the other side of that trial, and you do have a bit of an inexpressible joy. Like, how did I get from there to here? And that's what Jesus wants to remind us of. Every time we go through a trial, that trial is there to test our faith. 
That's why God may not send the trials directly, but he doesn't withhold them for us because he knows that our faith needs to be tested. It needs to be tried. It needs to, it needs to grow. In order for it to develop, in order to be strong, in order to have long-term meaningness, mean, meaningfulness in our lives, our, te- our faith has to be tried. So what do we do with this? Do you know anybody who's going through some trials right now? Do you know anybody whose faith is being tested? Maybe even the point of where they've lost their faith. Or maybe they're seriously doubting their faith. Or maybe they never even had faith in Jesus in the first place. And they're going through a trial without the help of Christ, without the help of faith. Our job then is to take this living hope that we have that is even more valuable than gold itself and share it with others. Maybe you could write a handwritten note to a friend who's going through a difficult trial or maybe say, hey, can we go have lunch? Can we go have dinner. Send them a text, but spell all the words, please. But you can use emojis. The smiley face emojis actually cheer people up. But seriously, people, who do you know that's going through difficult trials? And what can we do as the family of faith to encourage them in their trials? I think that's what Peter would say is our job in this, is to do exactly what he did bring encouragement to people in their trials. So think about that. Even take a moment while we're doing our prayers to to write some of those people, those names down in your bulletin or whatever. But really, your your task, and I'm going to do it too because I'm I'm not going to ask you anything I'm not doing, write a note to someone going through a difficult trial right now. Write a note of encouragement. Be the one that points to them the good news and a living hope in trials. Because Jesus is our living hope in trials. Amen? Amen. We continue. We express that living hope in the words of the creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the resistance of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the offering.
the offertory. Specifically, are listed in your bulletin, but I, I do challenge you and to think about who is a person or persons that you would like to write a note of encouragement to in their trials and see what God does with that. So we'll have a moment of pause in the prayer for you to, to think about and consider those people. God, we come to you today being so mindful that your son is the source of our living hope. Jesus is our living, a hope, a hope that does not fade, a hope that is tried, and it does go through trials, and it does sometimes bring us to our knees, but it, on the other end, it brings us a joy that is without expression. God, we recognize there are a lot of people in the world that are very, very far from a living hope, very far from a an expressible joy, people that are just trying to get through each day. So we offer them encouragement. We pray specifically, Lord, for, for Lil, for Renee, for Edwin, for Judy, for Rosemary, for Judy, for Dylan, who lost his father, for all who are grieving during this time, um, and for all the families of Bethel, each, especially the ten, each, each of the ten families that our prayer team prays for each week. Uh, we pray... Uh, in this moment, Lord of Silence, we, we offer up those that we know are going through various trials personally and give us the, the encouragement to, to encourage them through, through letters, through phone calls, through whatever way that may be expressed. Well, yeah, we have ongoing prayers for many people, Lord, who are struggling for long-term illness. We pray for Cindy, for Donna, for Rhonda, for Pastor Larry, for Karen, for Ann, for Olivia, for Marilyn, for David, for Kenneth, for Ruth, for Sean. We pray prayers of thanksgiving for the times that you have brought us through the trials, Lord, and our faith came out of it stronger. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for a, a great Easter weekend. Uh, we pray a prayer for you and praise to you for all the different ways that we get to share this living hope in our community. And we pray that we never lose sight of the mission that you have given us, which is to be ambassadors of the living hope of your resurrection. We pray all these things in your son's name who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn, number six, or four, I'm sorry, four, six, three, Christ the Lord has risen today. Hallelujah.
Hey, we have something. Go ahead and be seated uh, for the announcement. What, what do you have to share? Hey, we got a reward. Look at that. The most frequent volunteer group to Bethel Lutheran Church uh, from White Rock Center of Hope from Greg Smith. I'm assuming this is at the volunteer event yesterday. Deborah, 250 hours plus a volunteer painting the walls. She, her secret got out. So, so give yourselves a hand, especially our Friday crew. Um, to stand up. If you're part of our Friday group that goes to the White Rocks and Rope stand up, so you can be recognized. And Deborah, obviously, a, ma a massive volunteer person as well. So this is great. Thanks for sharing that. That's awesome. I was not even able to make it yesterday. We had it, but it was a beautiful event. Um, do you buy tickets, Jackie's out there, and, and you missed it, you missed Pastor Chris and Jackie in our 80s outfits, um, greeting the parents on Wednesday, but if you, are, if you haven't got a chance to see those pictures, we'll make sure you get them, because it is quite a contrast from the way he looks right now, I can, I can tell you, but please buy your tickets, um, last year was a great event, this is a great time for us to interact with our church and our preschool Last year, the proceeds went to help uh, renovate uh, our narthex and our, our welcome center, including the, the glass window and the, so those things. This year, it's going to towards a, a proper kind of break room and, and, and place for our, our staff, especially our preschool staff, to, to go for their lunch and, that, and those, those kinds of things. So really excited about that. A couple other announcements coming up. Uh, the, the Women's Guild uh, dinner, uh, 70th anniversary, October 7 8th. So please save that weekend as best you can. And we just want to thank for everybody uh, for uh, supporting the LWML, supporting our youth last week uh, for the, the Easter breakfast. And please, if you have not had a chance, grab a copy of the Strategic uh, Planning Committee's report. Uh, the, the video that we made to, to, to unpack that is available on our on, on Bethel at a glance. Uh, the, the biggest kind of takeaway from that, you'll be getting more of this in smaller doses as we go, is this idea of transitioning to developing community groups Based that, that, that emphasize discipleship and faith formation. So that's taking some of our current groups and, and, and kind of giving them that new purpose and also uh, to, to create some new groups that, that will be starting uh, by the next fall as kind of our table timetable for that. Uh, Dell's class is not meeting today. Um, Lil is uh, still recovering and Dell is actually having back surgery himself here in a couple of weeks. So there'll be an update on what's going to be the plan for that class will be be shared as soon as we have those details. You're welcome to join our class on the stage. All right. You're welcome to join Jerry's class on the stage in the meantime. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Okay. All the volunteers. Yeah. Jesus.